Welcome to today's webinar compiled and produced by the team at biznews.com. <laughs> That's the one thing I didn't work out. Although although we've now got our webinar go the interactive, we encourage you to pose questions to our guests. The more challenging, the better. And the earlier you get the questions in, the better the chance of having them answered. <laughs> The recording of this webinar will be available later today on the biznews.com channel on YouTube. I promise you I'll get that right next week. I was trying to kind of uh, mime a little bit there like a bad <laughs> Hong Kong karate movie. Yeah, you wouldn't remember those, would you, Adrian? Uh, Bruce Lee and and uh, well and then there was, was a guy there. who followed him. <laughs> <laughs> well, good to have you guys here. Um, as always, we we're going to be talking about Sunlam a little later uh, with the new chief executive Paul Hanratty. And I think for most people, the question is how can you work for Old Mutual for more than thirty years and then go and become the CEO of the opposition? Yo, it it shows how the world has changed, Dave. Yeah, well, you try to destroy the one competition, and now you've got to go and uh, build it up. After doing so much damage, you go there and kind of build it up again. It's the perfect situation. But uh, it is rather unusual because, Alec, you know, when, when you work for a business, you tend to become part of that culture. You know, it's, it's part of you. In fact, you contribute to the culture in a big way. And uh, if anything, and Adrian knows, so do you, that, Old Mutual and Sunlam, I mean, if you go back to their past history, two completely different uh, environments or co call it cultures, you know, one the English speaking, the other, which was, you know, mainly the Afrikaans speaking community. And Sunlam was always associated, you know, with, uh, with the Afrikaans speaking community, English, uh, um, Old Mutual the other way around. So uh, two proud, proud Cape uh, institutions. But it does show how the world has changed. Mm. Adrian, you're also a professor at Gibbs. Do you see this kind of thing happening? Uh, you, you you would be talking to your students one day and expect them uh, to, well, to do the case histories of these venerable old companies. But mm -hmm. I don't recall, not once, where there has been a chief executive of such a, a arch competitor who then later pops up as the CEO of the other one. Alec, I'm not sure if the analogies quite travel, but uh, you know, you see uh, strikers change football teams, uh, you see Formula One drivers change seats, and um, you know, yeah, the, you know, there's there's cultural uh, challenges, but uh, you know, Max Verstappen is going to move, um, and he's going to go from one extraordinary uh, outfit uh, to another. Yeah, you know, the, uh, and I think you guys are absolutely right. I would I would agree with you uh, without qualification that the issue of culture probably sits at the heart of this, and. You know, if that is portable, you've probably solved 95% of the problems. Mm -hmm. David, we were talking mm -hmm. off air uh, before we started today's webinar about the big stories that have uh, hit us today. I guess the biggest of them all, uh, most investors or traders more like, were worried that Donald Trump got COVID-19, was tested mm -hmm. positive. Uh, would this obese 70-ish uh, <laughs> fellow a die of it and how what a turmoil that would create but trump is much stronger than anyone seems to give him credit for he came through it with flying colors three days later he wants to get back on uh, on the stump so how did you read the way that mr mark had read donald trump's uh, positive COVID 19 test well in fact they read it negatively <laughs> um the market the strength in the market now that we're seeing in the u.s well, there, there, there are three elements. The one element is that there will be a major uh, stimulus package, but that's also connected with what they're calling now the blue wave. The blue wave is that the Democrats will take all three seats, you know, of, of power, being the presidency, the Senate, 
and the uh, House of Representatives. So um, people see that as kind of a positive move in the sense that it will bring a little bit of stability or it will allow America to kind of re-establish, rebuild some of the institutions because, you know, Trump is like a scorched earth policy. He's, or or so, I, I read in The Economist yesterday, I think it was Economist or FT, you know, like an elephant just tramp, in fact, it was Madeleine Albright, you know, just like an elephant trampling through uh, the grassland, you do leave some kind of destruction. So I think that's what the market is discounting. But it's too soon, you know, and I'm very, very nervous to to actually um, believe the polls and, uh, you know, take a bet on it. But, I mean, that's what the market, when you say, how is Mr. Market interpreting it, I think it's coming from that. And what happens is, we're sorry, when the Democrats do take over, they will pass a very strong, um, you know, recovery bill or a stimulus bill. There are two issues here, and I'd love to hear your view on them, Adrian. The first is, wherever I read, no matter what I read, if it's from a 22-year-old who's come straight out of university to some hardened old uh, media elite, they all think they have a right to, to say that Donald Trump is not only an idiot and a fool, but he, he, he has achieved nothing in his life. Now, that's just ridiculous. Here is a guy who's the president of the United States. He's built something. Uh, we might not all like him, we might not like the way he behaves, but it seems to be that the media has just completely gone on the one side against him. I've seen this so often in my career that when people attack a certain individual, there is a, there is almost like a, 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 and the antibodies of society kick in and everybody does the opposite to what the media is trying to tell them to do. Is there just a possibility that we're all reading this, or rather the pollsters once again, like they did with Brexit, are reading this wrong, and that come uh, the election in November, we're all going to wake up with not a blue wave, but perhaps something very different? Sure. I mean, what a great question. Um, what a great talking point. The, and, and and markets and bookmakers got it wrong uh, uh, at the last election um, against Clinton. Um, you know, completely misread it, underestimated uh, his ability to, well, uh, in the language of investing, to corner the market. <clears throat> and going into this uh, election, if you look at the odds, uh, the bookmakers are have got their money on uh, Joe Biden. Um, was on a a uh, program this morning where Strive Masiu was talking. He says he's long Biden. Um, so, you know, that's the way it's all pointed. Uh, I think what Trump has demonstrated to this point is don't underestimate the guy. Um, he has the capacity to pull rabbits from hats uh, and to, to defy the odds. What, what you have to uh, give him strategically is that his his strategy is uh, is extraordinary. His strategy translates into uh, into outcomes that you know you would regard as successful, whether you like the outcome or not. You know that's uh, that's a personal point. That's a business point. That's a political point. Uh, but from a strategy perspective, he says he's going to do this. He works on it. Uh, he brings uh, uh, approaches that are very hard to read, often chaotic, um, hard to form a counter strategy, impossible to debate against him, um, and and he wins the day. I think that that counts as success. Whether you like it or not is a different point, but he gets to the result that he wants to. Why is it that the media and academia to a large degree as well are so camped against the center road almost. It's it seems that that you got to be far left or you got to be on the left hand side. It's 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 a very strange. I take Biden, twenty years ago, if he embraced Bernie Sanders's policies in the United mm. States, he'd be laughed out of the room. Now it's sure. suddenly uh, something that mm. that people are embracing. It just perhaps America, perhaps the end of Pax Americana. Who knows mm. what it's telling us? But mm. it's very very different. Why would that be? Look, his, I think you could make the argument, no, no, I don't have to think, I can tell you, I'll make the argument that a lot of what Trump has achieved 
in the world of uh, business finance economics markets has either been handed to him by circumstance or is one often very very hard to repeat and maybe the second uh, argument I, i'd love to get dave's thoughts on these but the the, the one-offs and the hard to repeat so sure you know COVID needed a, a fed response the fed cut rates aggressively but that really fed um a bad pun but that really fed uh, uh, uh capital markets um the tax cuts were one-off, hard to repeat, um, and uh, the spending stimulus that he brought, one-off, hard to repeat. So he's in his first term, he's reached for all of these uh, policy actions, which are very, very difficult to repeat. He has played a, a hand strongly to one part of the market in the nationalist sentiment, you know, we're going to make America great again. We're going to build walls. Uh, we're going to keep the trade out. We're going to get the investment local, and so on. And that, you know, that that has uh, created uh, an economic stimulus. But it's it's hard to see how you how you do that again. Uh, uh, how you do it for another uh, five years, and then uh, the the part that I would say has been given to him is. Uh, uh, in, in, in COVID investment circumstances, this has really played into the hands of some big U.S. companies, you know, the, the FANG stocks. They have they have done well, and that's helped power the market. Um, and and Trump self attributes uh, in the very worst possible investment behavior, something that he isn't responsible for. Uh, he claims uh, uh, full full victory. Um, <laughs> Yeah, COVID has been a great, great ally of Trump. Well, it will be really interesting to see. Dave, I'd like to uh, just pose the first question to you uh, from our community, because we're going to be posing most of the questions to Paul Hanratty in a moment. Um, but before we do that, just to remind everybody, all members of the Business News community, well, it's not it's actually Business Premium members, you can ask questions. There's a little question mark uh, that is on your control panel. Click on that, ask your questions, and I'll pick them up. Uh, James Tubbs' question before we go to Paul Hanrat, he says, and Dave, can you answer this? Does the swing left and right not balance out the extremes? Is there no place for a centrist stance? I think there is. I think, you know, we would love to see a centrist. But I mean, American politics um, is so toxic. There's no middle ground. Nobody wants to compromise, which used to happen because it's seen as a um, as an action of weakness. You know, you're weak if you compromise. And I think to a large extent that has been brought about by by Trump. But uh, probably they see Biden as someone who's going to move to the center and who will bring back um, centrist policies. There's something, you know, just, just going back to what Adrian said initially, if we look at the polls, what's interesting about the polls is that Bad, uh, sorry, Trump is at the same level he was in 2016, like at 42%. The problem is that uh, Biden is now 12 points ahead at 54. And the mm. difference being the independent voter who's gone now for Biden. So the independent voter before, uh, four years ago, you know, was non-committal and then turned probably to, um, you know, they, they couldn't assess that, that the, the independent voter. But now the independent voter is only down to what's the difference, 4% or 5%. And the swing has gone to Biden. So that's why they're calling it. They're saying that the independent voter has gone there, that, that you know, the person in the center tends to be leaning towards it. Just one other point. I think when Adrian spoke about the uh, economy, he's right. You know, he's, he's, if it was left to the economy in January, you know, I, I think Trump would have just sailed in. But this COVID, mm. his whole handling of COVID has killed him. You know, that has just taken him down. And I don't think the American public or certainly are, are going to forgive him for it, even though he comes out, stands on the balcony like a dictator, you know, and talks to his masses from, you know, <laughs> a la Mussolini or whoever else. You know, I've never seen a, an American president talk from a balcony. But I saw uh, him. I saw him in Davos, <laughs> and he actually reminded me exactly of Mussolini. He walked, well, over the pictures I've seen of Mussolini, he walked in, 
everybody mm. now these are mm. uh, these are the the big hitters of the world was waiting for him to come into the room he came in with a big yeah. with a great coat like i think Mussolini <laughs> used to wear and yeah. uh, ambled down there he had it, the attention of everybody made a few little comments <laughs> And there was one fellow who who shouted, "Go home, Trump!" Oh well, you know they were all billion doubles to, to see him, and it 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 really he had that that firmness of jaw, that uh, that set uh, approach, which reminded you of a uh, of what you see in the old war movies. But whatever, Joe Biden, on the other hand, uh, in Davos, I sat in the front row when he made his talk as the vice president. He just you just love him you watch this guy and you think yes. what an amazing human being he calls himself we did then middle class joe he uh he then you remember because he was going to run in the previous election and then he stood back because he he helped one of his sons who was uh, who had cancer in a bad well he died of cancer eventually so it it does it looks like a, like a foregone conclusion but on the other hand stranger things have happened but we're not here to talk about politics i would like the two of you to give us some insights at the end of the program of what would happen to the markets if Trump wins or Biden wins, because we're starting to get close to that time now where people have to structure their portfolios accordingly. Um, John Marriott's uh, question, by the way, uh, uh, comment was economic stimulus from Trump may be, but his response to handling the pandemic has been atrocious. Mm -hmm. So supports mm -hmm. what you had to say, David. Mm -hmm. let's, yeah. uh, let's bring Paul in now though. Paul Hanratty is the chief executive of Sunlum. Uh, for many years in the past, Paul, I would be introducing you as the chief executive of Old Mutual. And we were we were jibber jabbering a little bit beforehand and said, my goodness, uh, for those of us who've been around the block a few times uh, to see the CEO of Old Mutual becoming, or chairman even worse, um, becoming CEO of Sunlum was like you'd expect uh, hell to freeze over before that happened. But I guess it it shows how things have changed. What do your old uh, or former mates at Old Mutual have to say about all of this? No, I have no idea, Alec. I don't. You know, I was out of Old Mutual for five years, and uh, I, I don't think about them or talk about them really. So uh, I still have friends, obviously, but we don't talk about work. Well, uh, I'm sure that the people at Sunlum uh, embraced you with open arms, and we're going to be talking about that in the next little while just to i've got on the screen now your uh, your bio uh, as you can see that you were a, a lifer at old mutual from 1984 to 2016 you're an actuary um were you did you have a sponsor did old mutual sponsor your your studies at uct is that the reason why yeah you they certainly they certainly did alec i was a bursary holder as were probably most other people working there in the actuarial side and how old are you now paul oh that's <laughs> that's that's a good question. I'm 59. I'm a Madala. All right, but, but not too Madala when you compare yourself with Mr. Shapiro, David. Are you offended by the? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, it's different. He's he just baby. studies the markets. That's an easy thing to do when you're a Madala. That is the one job. Actually, I think as you get older, you get better at is is uh, managing money. David, uh, you can have the first question. Hmm. I, 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 you know, you talk about that, so I'm going to, I'm going to use Paul's introduction to say, okay. And in fact, he just triggered a question when he said, you know, as you get older, um, you, you can, you can manage money because yes, you've done the roads, you've gone through all, you know, jumped through the hoops and kind of jumped over all the kind of hurdles that you have to go through. But, but Paul. You're in a particularly difficult position. I was looking at old uh, at Sunlum share price, and you know over the past five years, while you were out of old mutual and just retiring or doing what you were um, over those five years, you know Sunlum share price has done virtually nothing. It's gone down maybe twenty percent. It's it's minus four, minus five percent per annum. In other words, it would have paid to have put your money in the bank. You know, rather than some, it's not your fault, and it's not the fault of. There might be some responsibility of the people who ran the business, but it's been a very, very tough time to run a a financial services business or an insurer like uh, Sunlam. And you mm. know, reading through the your your interim results, um, 
you know, you do say that this is the most challenging period um, the company has ever been through. How how do you reverse that? How do you get people to come back in and say, look, I want to buy those Sunlum shares, you know, in the kind of environment now, and we'll go into the backdrop that you have um, you've you've actually posted. Uh, it's a tough, you know, tough position for you to be in. Yeah. And there's no, that look, five-year I mean, promise for you, David. So that's yeah. that's uh, kind of emphasizes what you have to say. Sorry, Paul. No, no, no. I think you're. You, I mean, you're quite right. So the share price um, pretty much stood still for a long period of time, and then it's um, it's obviously taken a very big uh, uh, decline in the current in, in the current year. And I think that you know the, the company had obviously been built up very nicely. Um, you know, over a number of years, it was performing strongly. It got a following from investors because of uh, the consistency of the earnings. Um, the earnings are very low risk in Sun in Sunlum. There's tremendous transparency of reporting, which is pretty unusual, um, you know, for insurance companies. And I'll give you one tiny um, and amusing anecdote. You know, when I first got involved with Sunlum, it was on the board as the audit committee chair, which is not something I wanted to do, but the person who was supposed to do it sadly, you know, passed away. And um, at the first meeting, and, and I was going through the agenda with the CFO at the time, and I said to him, why, why don't we deal with tax matters? You know, we need to get this on the uh, agenda and uh, have a look at the provisions. And he said, no, we've never covered this at the audit committee. I said, but Heine, you know, we need to, <clears throat> we need to look at all the tax schemes and so on. And work out if the provisions are adequate or not. He said, "No." He said, "This is Sunlum. We 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 don't have any um, tax schemes. We're not allowed to do that here." And it's it's a company that has been run very conservatively, very transparently from a financial point of view, and that has made you know gave it a very different position. So it got a premium rating over time. But you know, obviously, the last five years, you would know both in South Africa economically. And the markets have not done a lot. I mean, this is basically, um, you know, unless you were in tech stocks, you know, markets have been pretty, um, yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty flat basically for five years. And the earnings of a company like Sunlum are driven to a very large degree by by earnings. So what, you know, oc occupancy of beds is to a hotel. So uh, market levels are to an insurance company by and large. So that was one thing. The other thing is that um, under Ian Kirk's leadership, Ian wanted to diversify the earnings away from South Africa, and he pushed a very big transaction into uh, into Africa. And I think that for a number of reasons, that that has proven to be quite a weight on on the company. Uh, like many things that we do, it's going to be fantastic, I think, in the long term. But in the short term, a mixture really of some bad luck. And um, you know the environment, plus the fact that you know the integration was not handled particularly well, and I think that's because Sunlum is not an acquisitive company by nature. It hasn't done many of these things, and it took a very soft approach to the integration of that business. So getting some of the the synergies and and the disciplines in place, um, you know, actually, frankly, didn't happen initially. So I think between the level of the markets, the sentiment around the economics of South Africa and, and that big transaction all have weighed pretty heavily on the, the share price. But it's a fantastic franchise. Um, it's got a great platform, I believe, you know, for growing into the future. And actually, there's a big opportunity for us. And I think, actually, as we start executing a new strategy and and people the market can see results coming through i think we will will draw people back in i think the other thing not to be underestimated is that we had a very big uh international shareholder base um and that has undoubtedly um you know gone backwards as foreigners have lost faith frankly in in south africa as an investment destination um and we've seen more value investors rather than growth investors in our stock. Um, so I think the trick for us is to, you know, actually put some runs on the board and deliver some outcomes. 
And once people see that, I think we'll get investors back into the stock because it is got a very, very solid base to work off. Adrian, uh, your first question. Um, so Paul, thanks for uh, thanks for your time and uh, giving us the chance to explore uh, the business with you. Um, it's uh, it can only have been a, a, a very very tough last six months from uh, uh, new business um, uh, volumes, but uh, uh, there's two aspects that that stand out for me in terms of your rating. Um, uh, in that, in the, notwithstanding the fact that you traded a discount to uh, embedded value, you traded a premium relative to your peers, uh, barring discovery. But um, uh, the, the two aspects that, that stand out that, to me, could really look after uh, your new business volumes is geographic diversification and your product breadth. Um, and I'm interested just to hear a little bit more about your your perspective on the non-South African uh, experience and, and what that means for your longer term strategy and then uh, where you're seeing activity, where you're seeing strength and support in, in your product portfolio in, in this environment. Yeah, Aaron, I think you make a really good point. So, you know, when when we when I put up the half year results, I said to people that whilst we had a horrible financial result um, outside of South Africa um, in terms of profits, we had a fantastic result in terms of growth. So, you know, new business was up 35 percent. That's exactly why you're coming into Africa outside of South Africa for the growth. And of course, into India as well. So I'm a massive bull on on Africa. I think uh, you know for a whole variety of reasons, which we all understand. Firstly, you've got a, a demographic um, dividend, you've got rising wealth, and you've got a very you know low penetration of financial services products. So if you take a long enough view, um, there's no question that Africa can be a really good place. The difficulty traditionally is that people have small fragmented businesses um, they they have some whoopsies uh, in the outcomes and uh, it tends to put them off I think what we've got is we've got a big enough portfolio and in fact we want to shrink our portfolio in terms of you know number of countries so there's a list of countries that frankly we want to exit because they are too small to ever move the needle um, in in the in a positive direction they can only just take up management time but you know, for, for a large number of the places we are, I just think there are fantastic you know, growth prospects. And for the most part, in, in the shorter term, those are in general insurance or property and casualty insurance, but we're busy basically cross-selling life insurance into those customer bases. So instead of going and acquiring new life companies, we're, we're starting to cross-sell um, you know, life insurance. So in Africa, outside of South Africa, basically first uh, PNC insurance and then, um, you know, and then life insurance. Asset management and that kind of thing is, is a way further down the track thing. You would know that the, you know, the capital markets are very underdeveloped and it's a sort of a, it, it's a virtuous circle, but clearly if you, you know, if you can build up savings and investment businesses, that helps to grow the capital markets. But you kind of need the capital markets to be there as well um, to, to, you know, develop those businesses. So I see that as a much longer term, um, a much longer term, um, you know, horizon for us. And of course, in South Africa itself, Sunlum is very well diversified across the different, um, the different. Uh, you know, um, categories of business outside of banking, uh, we're in pretty much every segment to some degree, either, you know, really the, the strongest or, or close to the strongest. Um, and then, of course, India is the other place where we always have to remind people that there is many people living in India as they are in the whole of the African continent. Uh, again, I've always loved India and I understand it's a bit chaotic relative to somewhere like China, but I think it's got long-term good growth prospects for 
you know, a whole variety of reasons. And we've got a great business there that we've been invested in for 16 years. People forget that. And people that we we really know and like. And, um, you know, I think a very under undervalued franchise. It's got a lot of credit in it. That's the one unusual part to it. It's not just an insurance business. We're actually got a very big stake in the credit aspects of that business. And that's a little sort of uncomfortable for some people. But um, yeah, so we, we see a lot of growth actually outside. And, I, and this to me is where, you know, you talk about how do we bring people back into the stock. One, once we can start demonstrating actually that we don't just have top line growth, but we also can put the runs on the bottom line, control the risks a bit better um, and develop in some of these markets. I think we'll start to attract a different kind of investor who wants exposure to the African consumer and perhaps the Indian consumer. Paul, there are a couple of uh, questions about your bonus or share. Uh, the, the one came from David Melville who said, You'd only been appointed as an executive director of Sunlam for three months, and then a three million bonus share deal worth 161 million was awarded in advance. How does this work, and on what basis is it justifiable? And then there's another one from Mark Field, who who puts the figure at 235 million. So I guess you better give us an idea on what the numbers are. Uh, yeah. As a welcome gift, is it a bit excessive? He says when we have such disparity. What no, what I is think, the story behind all that? Yeah, look, Alec. I think firstly it's been poorly reported, um, and as you know, there are reporters who don't bother getting any facts before they write things. Um, so I personally think that if I was a shareholder in Sunlum, I would be delighted because I don't think there are too many executives who have a package that is as aligned to shareholders' interests as mine is. Um, and I said, when Sunlam approached me, I said to them that the one thing was on REM. I never ever wanted anything that would raise any concerns and I wanted to be 100% aligned. So basically, I am taking um, a very, very small cash element. And in fact, if it weren't for the, um, the permissions that we have from shareholders, which limit the number of shares that we can issue, I wouldn't have taken any cash at all. So I've, I'm actually getting awarded 5 million shares. Um, and I then have a cash package of just over 6 million Rand a year. I have no bonuses or anything else. And basically what happens is that those shares, those 5 million shares, they're not a gift. Um, actually, basically, as I achieve um, performance targets, they, they vest. Or if, and if they don't vest, they fall away. So at the absolute maximum, I could get 5 million shares. Um, at a minimum, I could get zero. And I could be working for five years for 6 million rand a year, which I think you'll agree is uh, w wouldn't be a bad deal for shareholders. And if I end up getting all the shares, you know, the, we'll have had to perform extremely well, in which case I would think that shareholders might be uh, fairly delighted. So that's that's in it in essence. And just to clarify one last um, sort of piece of uh, nonsense that's been written by journalists, I actually only get to keep the dividends once the shares are vested. So there are no um, there are no uh, um, there's no free ride here. And I, I don't know if any of the three of you how many other chief executives in South Africa their fortunes are tied entirely to the performance of the company less six million rand a year well the the only precedent you've got is uh i think uh would be Kurs becker who didn't take yeah, any Kurs becker and johan van sale had a very similar deal uh-huh well uh, and shareholders did very well out of both of those two periods so let's hope that uh, you achieve the same thing particularly as we as I we saw so earlier. that's Nothing the first time to be doing it but it's, it's fair <laughs> no, i think i believe it's fair Mm. David, your next question. Are you happy with uh, with that answer? Yeah, I've got. Look, I've got no issue as long as Paul does what he's uh, supposed to do. That's you know, and that will be in the share price. So we'll judge him along the way. I mean, Chris has done incredibly well for a nice person. I don't think anybody 
resents or regrets it. I'm, I'm, I'm not one person. I don't care who gets rich, to be honest. As long as the as long as the country does well and as long as the businesses do well, um, I'm not one of those, you know, um, who, who who really kind of criticizes it. You've got to you've got to look at the business, you know, and I think we've got some great examples where where CEOs have um, you know have have kind of rewarded themselves very handsomely. But uh, we'll make it we'll make it known when that does happen. But Paul, I've I, you know, I was very interested in what you said about Africa because the follow-up to what I was going to say is I was going to ask where you saw Sunlam, you know, three, four, five years down the line. And I I, I say that because, um, you know, I've been on the market, I think uh, I started when you were probably in primary school still. Uh, you certainly had it and you were working towards that old mutual bursary. So I started in 1972 at a time where uh, Sunlam Old Mutual, um, every February, you know, the, the salespeople would come around and sell us retirement annuity funds. And that, that, that was the entry point. You know, we were up in Joburg, which was dominated by Liberty. Um, it, wa it wasn't Sunlam territory. But the, the point that I'm getting to is that those markets are changing dramatically. We're moving much more towards a fintech type world. And uh, companies have now got to adapt themselves to this change in the way that people are going to be buying policies. It's not me. It's going to be my grandchildren, probably not even my kids, um, mm. who are going to change the way that they invest um, in, in, in insurance and so on. So that was going to be the question. But now you've come out with your other strategy, which is Africa, India, which really requires the same kind of salesperson that we used to see, which was knock on the door type person. How, you know, where are you going to be and how is Sunlum going to look in uh, yeah. you know, three, four, five years when you finally earn all those five million shares? <laughs> yeah, so David, I, I mean, I fundamentally disagree with you. So I think if you take India and um, and Africa, I think as much as it would be lovely to have the traditional salesperson, mm -hmm. actually, I don't know how often you've traveled to those places, but it's not mm -hmm. a realistic um, <laughs> uh, proposition. You know, the infrastructure in Africa uh, is weak and um, we actually have to use technology to get to people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you look at, um, if you look as a great contrast, in, in banking, retail banking in Africa, I believe is going to be driven by, um, you know, the telcos and related um, digital businesses, because uh, it's extremely difficult. Can you imagine, you know, your same statement, if you were chatting to me and I was at one of the banks, you'd be asking me about rolling bank branches out across Africa. Well, they're having their lunch eaten by, um, you know, business, digital businesses that are actually transacting massive volumes of uh, of transactions, and that's actually only going to grow as as people in these countries. Uh, they may be poor, but they are not stupid, and they can adapt to technology extremely rapidly. So, so I think actually one of the big tricks for us is to to drive that um, you know that thing actually very hard. I think actually, funny enough um we will we, we'll do a lot on the digital front in south africa as well i think fundamentally things will change in south africa as well but you know i was asking one of the um one, one of the big re global reinsurers was talking to me to the other day and saying you know they've got a, a whole digital strategy and so on and so forth and i asked them i said just as a matter of interest you've got clients in every part of the world i mean they literally have there's only four of them really of any consequence. So they've got every insurance company on earth as their client. I said, where do you see the best um, sort of innovation and, and digital activity coming out of? They said the, the, the worst place in the whole world is Europe, the least amount of innovation, okay? Mm. And the most amount of innovation is coming out of Asia um, mm. and some out of Latin America. So, um, and I think South Africa would probably be a little bit in the Europe category in the sense that, you know, whilst people want to change the way they do things, the old stuff still works. So there isn't the same burning platform. But in Africa and India, 
there's a burning platform to get to people to put technology in place. The other thing I always say to people um, that's interesting for me, so I don't know whether you, how familiar you are with someone like Half Greaves Lansdowne, but I'm a massive fan of their business as a customer. So I love it. I, you know, I can trade on there. I can run my own investment portfolio on there. I think it's a really great company. Um, the, the customer interface is absolutely brilliant and everything works. Um, but it's interesting that they are actually um, moving their business into the advice space from the, you know, the, the digital and internet space. And so you know, I get propositioned quite regularly by them to talk to a financial advisor um, to help me. Now, interestingly enough, they're not suggesting a physical meeting, but it's actually a, um, you know, a telephone or a, a video conference. But I, I think that where matters of investment, matters of um, how to structure your affairs are concerned, these are not black and white areas, um, and therefore they don't lend themselves as easily to a pure technology interface. And people will always want the comfort of, um, you know, being able to talk to somebody about it. And I think the real trick and the real difference, it's not going to be, you know, do you have David Shapiro stockbroking for you versus, you know, you do it like I do online at Hargreaves Lansdowne. I think it'll be a blend of the two where I can do a lot of the stuff myself. I can certainly um, look at all my values. I can see how the markets are moving and so on, but I can still talk to David Shapiro to get advice, not only on how to invest, what to invest in, but also in what wrapper to put it. So it is always the, one of the things that I felt slightly uneasy when I managed my own share portfolio is um, I'm quite comfortable by, with the investment side of it, but <laughs> have I got the tax side of it right and the inheritance tax and all of these things because you know it doesn't it doesn't matter to do a little bit better on the investment if you get um, you know inheritance tax wiping everything out so I think it's going to be man and machine working together in in the world of the future so if you ask me in five years time I think we will be a much more modern business at Sunlum than we are today and we will be much deep more deeply embedded in the African continent than we are today. Um, that's, you know, simply put how I'd describe it. Pete Lowe asked uh, Paul whether Africa is going to happen in your lifetime. <laughs> so I guess it, you, in five years' time, you reckon it will? Yeah, you know, Alec, I, so for me, I always have to explain to people that there's a difference between value and profits. Um, you know, and you see this in many businesses. So, I mean, you would know yourself that, uh, you know, if you went to somewhere like Amazon, you, I think you can buy probably 20 of the world's top retailers um, for the same, um, you know, for the same amount of money as their market cap and uh, your cash flow will look <laughs> very different. So I'm not saying that in five years time, Africa is going to produce the profits that we produce today in South Africa. But I think you will see the growth and the trajectory, and that luckily shareholders are able to, um, you know, to look forward into that. So, you know, but but I should emphasise that this doesn't mean because we're focused on, you know, the longer term, you know, growth of Africa and India, it doesn't mean that we're kind of not paying attention um, here in South Africa. So we. We think actually for Sunlum, actually about 60% of our strategic effort should go into South Africa because there's a lot of opportunity for us still here, despite the, um, you know, the macro headwinds that we face. Before uh, Adrian comes in again, and, and I think he would have picked up quite a lot of interesting issues on that, uh, not least because he studied value investing at Columbia Business School. Adrian, you can correct me on, on uh, that, but I think that's Warren Buffett's alma mater, Benjamin Graham. They were there as well. Yeah. For A lot of people are asking uh, in, in the circles that I move in whether Sunlum's new direction or new strategy is going to include the old strategy of taking partnerships in, for instance, Brightrock, uh, Easy Equities. Uh, I heard last week that uh, Sunlum was going to sell its stake in Easy Equities when it's able to put it to 
purple capital. How how are you looking at those? And to be you know pretty specific on that. Yeah. So I mean, look, um, Alec, if you're looking for what are we going to do with Easy Equities or Bright Rock? Um, firstly, we would never comment on any particular thing, but I can tell you categorically that we've got no intention to get out of any of the partnerships um, that we're in at present. And in fact, in the long run, um, you know, we're going to emphasize partnerships for the company because if we're going to expand and grow in the way that we we have ambition to do so, there's absolutely no way on earth that we're going to be able to do that by ourselves. We're going to have to partner up with other people. I personally would prefer to have a smaller number of really big partnerships that can really move the needle. So, you know, firstly, I should say, because I guess you you went there, we're extremely happy with the Easy Equities um, situation. I cannot describe to you what it's done for us and how it's helped us at Satrix. But, um, you know, if, if you measure what is the value of that compared to our partnership with somebody like Capitec, you can imagine that you can move the needle just a whole lot more uh, with that kind of partnership. So we are looking to build partnerships at Sunlam. I don't believe we have, um, you know, the skills or the um, ability in-house to get us everywhere mm -hmm. we need to be. And I just think the modern world you know, you just don't do things by yourself anymore in, in the way that, that companies used to. Um, yeah, so I guess there's not much more to say than that unless you've got anything specific to follow up. I think you have uh, actually addressed that question extremely well. Adrian, uh, your next question. Thanks, Alec. Uh, I'd like to go back to an issue that Paul um, uh, that Paul touched on, which is the uh, the digital models. And you know, we've seen in uh, in Kenya, for instance, the likes of Emma Kiba, which launched uh, uh, the government bond um, government bond on uh, smartphones. Uh, we see you know Lemonade in short term insurance. Uh, you've got um, uh, Zhang Rubao, the, the Alipay uh, and financial uh, business. And these, um, you know, they, they describe disruptors as businesses that come at you at both fronts. And not only do they challenge the business model and take your client to a place that you can't get to, but they touch them at a price point uh, that seems impossible to reach. You know, those are the, the proper disruptors. And so, now, I'd like to stay with this discussion with Paul just for a moment to you know, understand better whether your thinking is that uh, you have you, there, there's sufficient moats in the domestic market, in particular your biggest market, South Africa, that you've got enough um, uh, Teflon coating uh, to protect for some time whilst you build that. Or are you likely to partner with uh, with challengers who who bring new technologies and new models? Yeah. So look, I think um, Andrew, there's a lot there's a, <laughs> a lot of different points I think in your question, but um, I I would hope that we could um, you know we ourselves could be initiators of disruption, and I would much rather disrupt my own business. Um, than have somebody else do it to me. And we've got absolutely no problem with partnering people that we think can help, um, you know, disrupt the business. But, but the one thing I will say is that I think in established markets with established brands, it's actually quite difficult to disrupt them. There always seems to be an initial little burst and then um, getting to scale becomes an issue. And I'll give you an example from our own business. We started a few years ago a company called Indy, which was designed to sell digitally, you know, life insurance direct to the public. And it it puddled along. It had some really good people working in it. Great product. Tech all worked well. Sales um, almost non-existent. Um, and then they decided they put the Sunlum brand on it and suddenly the thing took off. And I think that one of the moats in financial services, probably actually in all products, but 
in financial services is um, is brand. And I always remind people that particularly in our industry as opposed to banking, um, we sell a very uncertain promise to people. So, you know, if you go to the bank, you know exactly what the, the terms of the contract are. I give you X, you give me Y in exchange for that. But in our game, we ask you to part with your money and we will give you an undetermined amount at an undetermined future date, quite often on a fairly gray um, set of circumstances. So if I said to you, Adrian, give me five grand a month, I'll invest it for you. I won't tell you how much you're going to get or when you'll get it back. Just trust me. Um, would you do that with anyone? And I think the answer is no. And I think that that's where it gets very difficult um, for the challenges. But I think that if we can blend, particularly in partnerships, our brand and an existing customer base with you know, the digital thinking and innovation, then I think you've actually got something quite powerful. And my argument is, is that a big company with a good brand um, and a good customer base is much more likely to succeed um, in, in building up new businesses than, than if you and I get together at home and work out of a garage to run a startup. I mean, we may be successful, but I think we'll have a better chance doing it in a, you know, in a, in a big company. And certainly, I, I am completely open to partnering up with people uh, in the space. Well, um, I've been. Alan, could, could I ask very quickly a uh, super quick question? Paul, so do you have uh, a sand pit or an incubator uh, initiative? Yeah, I'm starting to. I mean, I've only been in the job for three months, but it is my intention to create that. I'm actually at the moment trying to find people uh, to come and do that. Um, and not dreamers, because, you know, I've seen in other businesses. Um, you know, guys go out, particularly when times are good and, and there's loads of cash flow. People go and basically take a shotgun and fire in all directions. What I want to do is to try and work out, you know, what are the three, four, five things we should invest in that really move the needle for us rather than the shotgun. Because I think the shotgun is just a way of destroying value. Well, you've got you. Brightrock, you've got Indy uh, with Peter Castleden, and you've got uh, Easy Equity. So the three that we know about, I'm sure you, uh, we'll be watching to see where your next bets are landing. David Shapiro, uh, your turn for the next question. When Paul said he takes our 5,000 Rand and you know, just puts it away and <laughs> hopes to do the best for us. There's, there's something that bothers me. I sit as a, an investment advisor on a fairly large pension fund and I come across the difficulties of these pension funds to actually provide you know, decent returns, particularly in a country that's not growing. And one of the biggest obstacles we face, and uh, Adrian took me down last time, you know, he says, you know, you've got to match your liabilities with your assets, is <laughs> that uh, we have something called Regulation 28. Yeah. Which, and, and the one thing I can't understand about that is that we're getting so much good growth outside of this country. And I mean, it's, it's, it's not like it used to be. I just, uh, you know, if you look at China, China's still going to grow while every other country is is trying to keep up or just trying to get to pre-COVID level. So my question to you, is this something that needs revi you know, um, needs to be revised, um, where suddenly the 30% that you've got offshore starts going up and you have to bring it down because you're exceeding that 30%, et cetera. And all of this is to the detriment of your investors. And I mean, it's uh, the periods when South African markets have exceeded uh, offshore but I mean we're going into a very interesting period in the in the global economy particularly in the tech space etc is it is it something that that holds you back as well and that you've considered yeah look I think you know in every developing country um, I think exchange controls um, are a very profound question. And if you ask me 
in my personal capacity, what do I believe? Well, two things. I don't believe that there should be exchange controls anywhere. And secondly, I don't believe there should be anything like Regulation 28. So if you think of the investment universe in the world, which is vast, why would you want to constrain yourself to investing in the South African market, which is, I don't know, you can tell me better. It used to be 2% of global market cap. It's probably now, I don't know, it'll be less than that. Less than half a percent. Less than half. I was going to say something like, uh, yeah, 0.2%, but I thought you yeah, might think yeah. I've been rude. But um, it, it just doesn't make any sense at all. But I think balanced up against that is the, you know, is the bigger um, sort of policy agenda that, that countries have. And it's even worse in African countries where quite often you're not allowed to have any assets, um, you know, outside of, of South Africa. So if you ask me, yes, it would be in, in an ideal world, we wouldn't have any uh, regulations of that sort. And you would know yourself, I'm sure, that if you look at private client um, money in the wealth space, that if you look at what proportion of assets people have now abroad, it certainly ain't 30%. It's more like 50%. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what we do about it, though, I think is a different issue. You can see here that in the clamor to fix um, the woes in South Africa, you know, there's talk about things like infrastructure investment. So all of these things are encouraging one, um, you know, to, to invest, you know, locally. The, the, I think the policy constraints that the government have are going to put a, you know, a dampener on any hope we have of, of Regulation 28, you know, loosening up in any material sense. But, um, you know, if you've, if you've got a bright idea for how to solve that problem, I'd love to hear it. Adrian, your final question. I, 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 just, just to Paul, I've got the same idea oh. as you. <laughs> you know, in other words, uh, unconstrained, except that um, you know it, it depends, and and that's where you would put the liability on the, you know on the big houses, and I think that's where the big houses would um, you know would prosper. And I ask that because it's a way of getting your performance up, and of course attracting um, a lot more investment towards you. You know, because it is, you know, you say that in your results, just how performance is weighed on you. And to a large extent, that has been brought about simply because of the constraints um, that you're under. Thanks, Paul. But really, thanks for the way that you've responded to all questions. Uh, I'm not saying goodbye to you. I'm just saying that they've been very, very valuable uh, mm. and uh, in, in, in the way that you have answered the questions. Thanks. I appreciate it, Dave. Uh, thanks, Alec. Paul, um, perhaps an unfair question, um, but if you were to be able to allocate your capital to any insurer globally, who would be your, your go-to investment? Hmm. Um, and it can't be Sunlum. <laughs> I know, I know that. You wouldn't, <laughs> ask, you wouldn't ask me that. I'd probably go to Ping An in China. Okay, which is uh, Discovery's uh, toe in the water, eh? Unfortunately, uh, <laughs> but, but I think I think for a whole variety of reasons, um, it it would be it would be them. Um, the the other company which I think is a brilliant company but is not a quoted company, I think it's the best insurer on earth is USAA. It's a mutual company. Um, I think for two or three years in a row, it's won the most, the best consumer orientated company on the on the planet Earth against, you know, anyone. And um, that's an absolutely stellar business, but it's a mutual, unfortunately. So you can't buy stock in it. If I could, it would be that one. Well, the last question from our community is from Ian Fraser. And he says, does Sunlum have a strategy to invest outside of South Africa in non-insurance type startup businesses? That require to be funded, but once they're operational, are hopefully very profitable. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what he's driving at exactly. Um, like we, um, I'm certainly interested in businesses that actually are uh, tech businesses that will distribute our products. Um, 
and of course we have some appetite for investing in businesses generally in you know outside of south africa uh, in the in the private equity space but you know startups per se are probably not we're, we're probably not the place you'd go to uh, to look for capital i don't think that would be our uh, our strength well, thank you for being with us today, for answering the questions that we had. I'm sure there are a whole lot more. So after the prelim results, we'll um, see if we can fit into your diary again. It really has been good talking with you and getting the insights into uh, another company, a highly investable company. And we look forward to the next time. So thank you very much. Before, before we sign off, uh, we'd like to get Adrian and David's views on, on what we've just heard to maybe put that into some kind of a context for us. Uh, David, do you want to start? I, look, I, th as I said, I, I really appreciated what, uh, you know, what Paul said, particularly about where Sunlum is going. And I, I just wish him good luck. And I don't, you know, he's got the competency, he's got the education, he's got the experience. I just hope he can bring about in a way that can, you know, can lift uh, the earnings and take companies like Sunlum uh, just off this base that we've seen. But he was very honest and I think uh, very informative. So, you know, I thank Paul very much. Adrian? Now look, when, when we met uh, last, when I was on the show with you and David, uh, we spoke about um, Aspen with Stephen Saad. And you know my comment was highly investable, lots of tailwinds. I think uh, the reality is that Sunlam faces lots of headwinds. Um, most obviously, the domestic headwind, uh, with with uh, which doesn't look like it's going to abate or ease anytime soon. I think that's a real challenge to to the business, and it's in an industry which is more vulnerable to disruption. I think South African financial businesses. Um, uh, are on the back foot and have been very slow uh, adopters and adapters. So I think that to me, there's two critical aspects uh, and, uh, and Paul spoke about both of these, which, which I would venture he's got between his teeth. Uh, and that's about finding other markets and finding other models. Uh, and I'm encouraged by that. The, the, the business from a valuation and investment perspective really stands out uh, and i would allocate capital to someone based on where it stands and uh, and the opportunities that it's got uh, on the table so as a value investor it's starting to look uh, quite appealing yeah um you know i'm always tr keen to try and get that word value out of the equation because like you know you get painted and then you, know, you just can't get uh, it's like well that's the way you think so you know for me always investing is about is it a good asset and is it a good price? And you can call me whatever type of investor that characterizes, but is Salam a good asset? Absolutely. Conservative, well-run, strong balance sheet, great teams, nicely diversified. Is it a good price? It trades at an attractive discount to embedded value. So yes and yes. Adrian, lovely having you back with us again today. And uh, as always, David Shapiro, uh, before we, we end off that, uh, that question that came out right in the beginning, if you recall, um, do you want to apply your mind to it, Dave? You forget I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the beginning was a long time ago. <laughs> it was a long time ago. All right. You both excused. We won't worry about that. But uh, it really well, was I, what I happens in the election. Uh, oh. What happens in the election if Biden wins? Is it okay. bullish for stocks? Or if Trump wins, is it bullish? For, so which way, in other words, should we uh, it depend? People shouldn't be structuring their portfolios on the basis of a Biden or a, or a, or a, a Trump win, but uh, what is it likely to happen so that at least you can move quickly when the result is known? The market will be strong. And it's both Biden, either Biden or Trump will introduce a very strong stimulus package. The only difference is going to be in the energy space, you know, because Trump is pro-energy, <laughs> Biden, pro clean air, pro, pro uh, renewables. So I think that's the only difference. Trump comes in, energy stocks go. 
um, Biden comes in, energy stocks go the other way, you know, in other words, under pressure. And that, that's the only area. I mean, I'm trying to, I'm being simplistic, but, but overall, once the uncertainty of the election's over, I think markets will steady and we'll be back to where we were. You know, we're still in a very strong uptrend. I think it'll continue. Adrian? I think to add to, uh, to Dave's point, there's there's two further um, sectors or segments that could be simulated. The one would be um, uh, uh, trade logistics, um, which would benefit from the, f the lower walls or even falling walls, and and emerging markets in particular would uh, would would get a stimulus from Biden. So Biden, uh, if he gets the ticket, uh, I think it would pivot in favour of those sectors uh, and those market segments. Well, gentlemen, uh, you've given us lots of food for thought. Uh, we heard from Paul Hanratty, chief executive of Sunlum as well. Uh, um, Adrian says it's highly investable. Uh, because it is trading at a discount to embedded value. Before you go, David, uh, are you putting any money or would you be putting any money into Sunlam? Not at this point. I think for those headwinds, that, 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 that that's not against Paul in any way. And uh, I just think that there's a lot to go through. But we watch, you know, I'm not, I never say never. You know, I just, I just think there's a lot better to go for uh, offshore at the moment. There's so many good stocks there. And Ping Yang is one of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we can buy it. <laughs> <laughs>